For a long time, Gershwin had been haunted by the idea of writing an opera. Through jazz, he had become increasingly interested in black culture. He had read DuBose Hayward's best-selling novel, Porgy, the story of a crippled black beggar. Gershwin, who had not forgotten his humble upbringing, sympathized with the plight of the poor. But what drew him mostly to the subject were the dramatic and musical possibilities a black opera could offer. In 1934, Gershwin traveled to South Carolina. He retired to a little shack on Foley Island near Charleston and began to compose fiercely. After 20 months, the opera was finished. There were offers from the Metropolitan Opera House, but Gershwin wanted Porgy not only to reach large audiences, but he also wanted a Negro cast. The Metropolitan Opera could not guarantee either. and sing and dance for two instead of one. I had an appointment to sing for him. To my surprise, got off the elevator, he opened the door and it was he. Then an all white uniform, white clothes. And I said, I'm Todd Duncan, and he said, I'm George Gershwin. It was on that day that after I sang just a part of an old Italian song, uh, aria, just part of it. He looked up and he said, will you be my porgy? I wrote a letter to George Gershwin asking for an audition, which was granted within two or three days. His secretary rang and asked me to come and bring some music, which I did. I was uh, asked to come back and sing for his mother a week later and for Ira and other friends another week later. And then, as I mentioned before, he would telephone to me and say, Anne, come down and sing. I've written now five pages more and oh, I want to sit here. How it sounds in your voice. I never supposed for a moment that I would get the part of this. Uh, we will start with the piano solo uh, at five bars before nine, because uh, the piano has a solo lasting about two minutes. We, we will not waste time with now. Five bars before nine, scene one. <laughs> The opera was directed by Ruben Mamoulian and conducted by Alexander Smallers. Gershwin himself supervised the musical direction. This footage was shot during the rehearsal. Gershwin had studied and worked hard at the material. He had attended prayer meetings, trying to model his recitative on the inflections of Negro speech. Many of the choral passages are deeply rooted in spirituals. I first heard it from George Gershwin's fingers and his own voice. The very beginning of it sounded, oh, so foreign to me, and I felt uh, that it sounded like chopsticks. But very soon, it segued into something that was so beautiful and something that I will never, I will never, uh, it will never die. It went immediately into summertime and I thought that I was in heaven.
things, an idiom, an American idiom and an idea that I'd never come across. I, I didn't hear it in Schubert or Schumann or Wolf. It was another idiom which I didn't know anything about. And I loved it. I loved it immediately. It was on my skin, it was in my blood, in my soul, in my very heart. I didn't have to be logical and think about it. My solar plexus told me that this is it. I got plenty and nothing, and nothing's plenty for me. I got the sun, I got the moon, I got the people you see. The folks with plenty and plenty, gotta pray all the day. Seems with plenty, you still got to worry how to cheat the devil away. opera about it purports to be about Negro life but it is by a white man the play is by a white man it's a white man's view of Negro life and the music is a white man's view of Negro music uh, the uh, black people themselves who act and play or and sing the opera uh, are of a divided mind about that they don't really like white people's stories about them because they don't think they're quite true. Uh, sort of mythology, you know. Well, I'd like to know, what is a black man's opera? In the first place. I mean, he wrote an opera about black people. But that's Gershwin's idea of black people. And that's perfectly valid. So I... Uh, don't know about this idea of a black man's opera. I think that he captured a, a Negro idiom very, very well in Poetry and Bess. Coming from the old country and oppressed into a new country, that's where a man takes on new elements. And I think that was part of the answer of George Gershwin and, and of his brother, both. When it opened in New York after a tryout in Boston, the audience gave it an ovation which lasted over 15 minutes. Many people felt that Gershwin had written the first genuine folk opera in American history, but the critics, as usual, did not know how to place it. And even such a distinguished musician as Virgil Thompson wrote a scathing review. In 35, some people couldn't accept it as an opera because it was a kind of a hybrid. It was a Gershwin musical written like an opera. There's a tendency for so-called well-educated musicians and musicologists and critics to pat him on the head until suddenly they realize maybe he, he knew what he was doing. And Porgy and Bess certainly proves that. It's got a life of its own now. That the communication, the strength, the drama, the passion, that comes in the grand operas is in Porgy and Bess. And the ingredient, the main ingredient that is in Porgy and Bess is the same ingredient that's in Tosca, the same ingredients that's in Siegfried. And that means performance, passion, communication, sheer heaven, excitement. 
theater. Dealing with Negro life, he wrote, I have brought to the operatic form many elements that have never before appeared in opera. I have created a new form which combines opera with theater. Gershwin had finally reconciled his two loves, that for serious and that for popular music. The last few years, the Gershwins lived in Beverly Hills. They moved into a palatial home, which became the place for interminable parties and dinners, rubbing shoulders with the rich and the famous. Gershwin did not delude himself about Hollywood. He called it a place of overrated personalities and false priorities, where all they want are hit songs one can whistle. There he is. There he is, Thorin Ziegfeld. Get a good look. He's with his wife. A composer working in Hollywood, however famous, was just another guy working on the movies. He and I sat up at 5 o'clock in the morning at his home in Beverly Hills, and he told me how unhappy he was, and that he was making a lot of money in films. And he says, Todd, I'm not the kind of composer where a man tells me I need five songs for this film, not compose. He says, I can't do that anymore. And he says, I'm dying to get back to New York and to compose when I want to. He was not just a happy-go-lucky fellow. He had a very melancholy and I think a very lonely side too. I always had the feeling there was something worrying him in the back of his head. He was a very complicated person. He had so many different sides. And if one was sensitive, one could sense uh, this conflict, uh, so to speak, in his uh, behavior. In February 1937, while playing his concerto in F in the Philharmonic,